Hey guys, Adam from Blue Line here. We've got our expos wrapped up. We really appreciate everyone that came out to the Denver show. It was awesome. We had a huge turnout. It was so great to be able to meet so many of y'all on the road. We really, really appreciate everyone who came out. But today we've got our last installment of the dorsal takeover of the Blue Line channel. So this is a little bit of a trailer for a film that they're going to be releasing on their channel. So make sure you like and subscribe to see the rest of it. But the teaser is, will Ben be able to catch a Grand Slam on foot in Mexico? Also, make sure if you are around, you come out to an F3T event. We have a film in it we're so excited about. It's called Steve's Red. The Dorsal guys filmed it. And it's all about Steven trying to catch his first redfish, which is premiering in Salt Lake later this week. We sponsored this film, and I personally tied all of the flies for it. So we were super excited to see how this went. If you've liked the dorsal takeover, let us know in the comments. We want to do this again, but we want to make sure that you guys enjoyed the content and liked the idea. So stay tuned. And also, Blue Line's got some stuff coming out for March. So we're really excited about it. Thanks, guys. If you were going to write a story about someone catching a Grand Slam, I think there's some essential ingredients. They need to be a proper fly angler, someone who knows the value of catching a permit, a tarpon, and a bonefish in the same day. They need to be outfitted to the nines, right? The best gear, the best fly rod, the best fly reels. They need to go to an elite lodge to make them deserve a Grand Slam. They need to be superior to all fly anglers because again, they know what they're doing to pursue this goal. Well, this is, this is not that story. We've talked about this before, but at Dorsal it's worth repeating. Ever since we were 18, we've done these bootstrapped, embarrassingly low budget trips where we go around the globe and try to catch what, what we can. I don't have any audio on this thing. <laughs> Which kind of led us this year to look at an area of the Yucatan we'd actually overlooked for a long time. from the species that contains the variety of like different locales that this area had. The kind of off the beaten path that we love, like the Yucatan just made sense to us. And so while we were on another year of a tight budget, we were like, yeah, yeah, the, the Yucatan, this area of the Yucatan makes a lot of sense for us. So when we were prepping up for our trip to Mexico, just a lot of things like stuck out to us, right? It's from an area that has a strong Mayan influence. So the food is gonna be just very unique, right? We were talking with folks uh, who live there, uh, just about the, you know, the different food types we could get. Um, I mean, just goodness, there's a rich array of fruits, vegetables that we haven't experienced before, um, types of tacos we haven't experienced before. I mean, just like, there was so much about this trip that had nothing to do with fishing that we were so excited about. We love traveling for, to Central America because in most experiences we have, it's like Southern hospitality on steroids. Like this is like for us as a bunch of Alabama guys, this is like coming home, except you know, it's tropical, which is plus. So when we looked at the area, like there's just like, again, so much to take in, the food, the people, the, the idea that there were going to be, you know, inland lagoons we could fish, there would be these beaches that, that bonefish, tarpon, snook, all just swam down the shoreline. Um, like, it's just, there's so much there. We're just really, really excited about going to this area of Mexico. 
So for once in our lives, we took off from Birmingham, Alabama, took a little stop in Miami, and then jetted our way to the Yucatan. And I gotta admit, like, I was super surprised when nothing went wrong. Like, our vibe is something always going wrong. So we arrive in the Yucatan, we get our rental cars, and we strike out, driving across, um, again, some, some pretty remote areas of the Yucatan, getting some fresh roadside treats as we go, um, before we finally made it to the, the house we had rented for the week. When we started to rig up for this trip, there's just that, that anticipation, right? Like, no one's gonna sleep the first night. You know that we're there to try to catch as many fish as possible. We're there to have a lot of fun. Um, but there's also, if I'm gonna be honest in our team, a little bit of, a, of impending doom, right? Typically these trips start off for us really, really slow. Um, we gotta learn the area, we gotta learn the guys, we gotta learn what we're doing. And just, I mean, luck usually doesn't go our way. And so when we start out for the first day, I'll be honest, I had pretty, pretty low expectations. Um, first day is probably gonna be a lemon. We're gonna learn from it, readjust and go from there. And I honestly would have no idea that the first day would start the way it did. So the first day we get up and get ready to go. I'm a big coffee snob, so I was brewing some Mexican coffee on the stove, making some eggs, getting excited about the day. And uh, we kind of planned out, we were gonna split up the group. So half the group was gonna go south and half the group was gonna go north. And so I was in the north group. And so um, we met up with our guide, Nick Denbo, and he was like, hey, I'm gonna put my John boat into this little lake right by your house. And we're gonna try to get a tarpon on the board. And again, I, I mean, I love tarpon, always have. Hot, hot take here, I love baby tarpon, right? All the jumps with none of the four hour bulldogs or the big boys, again, that makes me less of an angler or whatever, but I love baby tarpon. And my, and my brother David's on the rod because he just recently got into fly fishing. So we're like, look, there's not a better way to break into a fly rod and assault than a tarpon, so get ready. And so me and Kai are in the, in the John boat, and um, sure enough, David starts tangling with a couple tarpon. Look like a really good sized fish in the patch of glassy water right straight behind that second buoy at 10 o'clock. I'm way, way out of range. He it again! Yeah. Do you think you hooked him? I have no idea. Survive the next jump and then go for a No, I didn't. Oh. No matter. Um, he had an experience, so he uh, pops off a couple of fish, a couple of jumps go the wrong way. So he, he, he goes, dude, this is so much fun. And he hands me the rod and says, now it's your turn. And I was like, I can't wait. So we're fishing along and um, sure enough, throw a little dark bug against the, the mangrove shoreline, strip, strip, strip. Tail nip, maybe. He's on it, oh. Yep. Little bastard. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna high stick him for you, Dave. Keep keep the focus on the line. Jump. Oh. oh, is that really, I'm just gonna get one jump out of you? Come on, dude, you're a baby, give me a little more. Uh, like I faced him, uh, that's why, he's foul. It's not in his eye, I don't think, but uh. Oh. Caught one. I oh, know, he had it. That's just in the corner, that's all right. Oh, is that under his eye? Uh, yeah, it kind of rotated around in his mouth, actually. Looks like it's in the, in the, in the corner of the maxillary, maybe. Yeah, from the outside. So right. swiped him. <laughs> well, there's that long old tail on there, you know. Little baby tarpon, again, it, and I, the way I look, think about this as an Alabama guy, it would be a good bass, and it, tarpon fight harder than bass, so this is great. And so it's, I mean, it's a tiny tarpon. But I catch a tarpon, release it, and uh, I'm on the board, and so next up is Kai. And so we keep on fishing this little lake, and, and, and are kind of wrangling a few, few baby tarpon here and there. And then basically we fish the entire shoreline, and so Nick goes, all right guys, um, let's, let's load up the John boat, get out of here, Let's go hit the beach. I'm a trashy angler, so like, you know, when I'm at the beach with family, I love catching ladyfish on the fly. So he's about to take it to a beach where there's bonefish and permit. Like, I, I'm great. <laughs> I'm excited. 
So we hit the beaches, and um, it's a little bit of a slow start. So they have a lot of stuff there called sargasso grass. And so this is the, the floating seaweed that is kind of this tan color, and it creates these big mats uh, on the shoreline. Um, and right now in the Yucatan, they're getting a lot of the stuff. It kind of covers a lot of the shoreline. Um, but so we start fishing around this because basically um, the red water, so where the, the, sh the sargasso grass rots, kind of pushes fish away, but it also includes a lot of nutrients. So the edge lines of sargasso is really, really good for fishing. And so we start fishing the, the beach, and um, I throw in a couple bonefish. And it just... Two more, two more! Oh, really good one. Oh. Three cut. Pop, pop. Oh, over the grass. And it's weird. The bonefish don't want to play. And you're, we're on like a deserted beach. Like there's, there's, like, why would a bonefish not want to play? Like if they haven't seen a fly in probably months, if not longer. Like this should be like kind of a shoe in, right? Just nothing. We change flies. Don't want to play. And um, so we walk on down about a mile down to a, another sandy point. And Nick's like, hey, this is a pretty good area for permit. We've got good, clean water, a lot of oxygen in the water. This might be a place where we'll see some permit. Like, like, I want to admit, like, the, the idea of catching a permit has always intrigued me, but I've never cared enough. Yeah, that's, that's a hard word. Cared enough to, uh, to go after permit because I've just heard about how difficult they are to catch. And I just don't have a lot of time off. Like, if I'm taking time away from family and work, like, I want to catch fish that want to play, not fish that are mean. <laughs> so, and sure enough, we're on this beach and we see all these blackbacks, these little slivers of permit that are riding the surf, looking for floating crabs, shrimp, and things like that. And so, we start to throw at them. And, and the fish would come by, you'd throw at them. I mean, there was times where the fish would hide kind of in the clean water in the edge of the sargasso, and then sneak out right in front of your feet and be like, oh, oh crap. Well, that was a permit, right? They would literally come within three feet of you. It was insane. So we're fishing this part of the surf, and sure enough, there's permit coming in and in and in. And we just start throwing at them. And these beachside permit, typically, from what we hear, you just throw shrimp patterns and see if they're aggressive enough to eat. Like, we're throwing at fish, they don't eat. We're throwing at fish, they don't eat. And so, um, I start getting pretty frustrated, right? Like, we, we caught fish in the morning, getting to lower in the afternoon, and, and it's just not happening. And so I have these two fish that come in, and one's a pretty good 20 pound fish, the other one's way smaller. And they come in, they're kind of surfing, and I make a good throw to the first one, and he's, he's just like, no, no, I don't want this. So I make another presentation, let it drift a, drift a little lower, and then retrieve it back slowly. Again, he's like, dude, I don't want this. So I get frustrated and I throw it again as they kind of go away. And again, this is bad etiquette. This is bad etiquette. But I just throw it on their backs and, you know, kind of dejectedly put my head down. And the smaller one turns around and gives chase. So I was like, oh crap. So I strip back and sure enough, this little one rides away and gobbles my shrimp pattern. So it hooks up and like I start screaming. Nick runs down the beach. He's like, you've got a permit, you've got a permit. I was like, ah, what do I do now? And, and in my head, like typically bonefish, they do three runs. They go one long, one medium, one short, and you land them. Permit don't do that. They just run and then they stop and then they run again and they could be even longer. Run and, and then that's that. I mean, it's, it's super random. Um, and so I fight it, fight it, fight it. And again, it's a little guy. Uh, some of the other guys might have called it a pompano. That's fine. Uh, it was a small, it was a small permit, but I landed it until I had my first permit on the fly. And so that was very, very cool. And so for me, again, as someone who's fly fishing since they were 12 years old, you know, this is, you know, like a pretty cool accomplishment. And so I kind of sit back and I'm on the beach and I'm like, it's pretty cool. Like I, I caught my first permit on the fly. And Nick looks at me and he goes, yeah, well, um, you got to get that grand slam now. And it hit me. I had caught a tarpon in the beginning of the day. I had caught a permit at the, you know, close to the end. All I needed was a bonefish. Like, how hard could it be?
It turned out it was very hard. Every turn, they were like, nah, I don't want what you have, right? The, the, the permit ate better than, than the bonefish did. Missed, missed fish. I mean, nothing, none of them. I would throw six feet ahead. I would throw 10 feet behind. It didn't matter. They didn't want to play. And so, um, yeah, I failed a grand slam on a bonefish. In the Yucatan, where they're super easy to catch, apparently, I couldn't even I couldn't even get a uh, a mudding bonefish. I failed a grand slam on a bonefish.